Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfeld, and welcome to Back to the Bible Canada. Delighted to have you join us. Um, I'm starting a new series today, and we're going to talk about the missionary God and the whole enterprise of Christian missions, uh, what it means, what it's for, what drives mission on, how do we define what we're talking about when we talk about Christian missions. So I want to do that and lay some groundwork for that today and, and talk about how God, as the creator of all things, had a plan for the world. And a plan not just for, you know, my family or my culture or my nation, but a plan for the earth. And so that's what I want to talk about today. And I want to introduce you to this God who's got a heart to do something on this earth and who is determined to accomplish his purposes. So um, let, how, where do we begin in this whole uh, conversation? It was a number of years ago now, and it was right before the service started. I was waiting to go into the sanctuary, um, and the singing was about to begin, so I was just a little late. I wanted to make sure they got in, and somebody trapped me in the foyer and said, um, you know what, I'm having a great deal of difficulty with this idea that if anyone doesn't believe in Jesus, they're going to go to hell. And so they just kind of blurted that out. And I, I was heading into the, the sanctuary to worship. So how do you have a meaningful conversation, you know, in that little split second moment? I didn't know how. I said, you know, we've got to talk about that later. And, and I don't even remember if we ever did. But I do know that when we talk about missions, um, there's always this question, what about those people who have never heard about Jesus? What about uh, those individuals who are, well, for lack of a better expression, are just garden variety uh, sinners um, and uh, who have lived, you know, yeah, maybe in disobedience to God, but they haven't done anything. They haven't, you know, they haven't murdered anybody. They haven't raped anybody. They haven't burned anybody's house down or stolen their money. They've done none of that kind of stuff, and they've just lived their lives. Are we to believe that such a person is under the wrath of God? You see, that's a common question and a common point of discussion that we have, especially in North American and Western churches. There's a sensitive spirit that's come up that says, is that really to be? Um, you know, North American Christians often think this is a matter of a philosophical inquiry, whereas in the history of the church, it's been a matter of motivation for the greatest enterprise the church has ever been involved in. That is to say, Jesus' very last words to his disciples before he was taken up into heaven, recorded in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, um, therefore go out to all nations, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you for, for lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So it's called the Great Commission. Go out into all the world. Find every people group of all of the nations of the earth and declare the good news about Jesus so that they might come to know him as their savior and submit to him as their Lord. Uh, that's the, the cause of the Great Commission. And often the, the driving, motivating force behind that is that humanity is lost. People who have never heard are in a lost condition. And we have this saving news, how cruel it would be to withhold it from them. So you can see that you know, many times today, people like to embark on a philosophical discussion, but in history past, uh, people have rather seen this as marching orders that compassion for the lost compels us to pay any sacrifice necessary to go out. So that's a lot to do with missions. So, uh, however... Uh, there's a couple of other things that I also want to uh, talk about. I mean, many of us, when we talk about missions, uh, tend to be more man-centered than we are God-centered. Um, so that's an important question as well, and I'm going to need to unpack that. Uh, here's what I'm going to say. The greatest thing that we can do in missions is not to meet the needs of others. The greatest thing that we can do is to proclaim the greatness of God. Now, the minute I say that, I can almost hear someone saying, hey, doesn't he think, doesn't he think that, in fact, the needs of others, uh, poverty, uh, injustice, um, hunger, um, all of these, you know, lack of education, don't you think that these are important issues in the human race? And my answer is, yes, they are. But what I'm really wanting to say is the greatest need of all is so that the entire earth hears something of the greatness of God. So I'm going to need to unpack that. So where do we start? 
I think the place to start is to ask the question of God the Creator. When the great God who made all things made all things, what was his purpose? What was his motivation in creation? Why this grand enterprise? Why does the universe exist? Why does the earth exist? Why do we exist? What was the creator God all about? And so uh, let's try to answer that question. Why does God create? Now, there are some people who will answer that question by saying, God was looking for fellowship. God was looking for a loving relationship with human beings. That's why he created us. And I'm going to say that's dead flat out wrong. Uh, You should never think of God, the great solitary God, as a God filled with needs who wanders around empty spaces for eternity past and says, how do I fill this nagging, lacking, you know, this this hole in myself? I mean, how can I fill this up? Ah, I got an idea. I'm going to make people and have a relationship with them. Then I won't be so lonely. Uh, Indeed, that's how some people conceive of God. They conceive of him as a needy God and that human beings are created to fill some kind of a lack that exists in God. So how do we get at that? Well, let me begin by telling you the story of a missionary journey. Indeed, it's the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. Um, He starts in northern Greece and he's working his way down. And he finally comes to the city of Athens. Athens in Paul's day was not the largest city in Greece. That, uh, that prize went to a city called Corinth, one that many of us won't even have heard of today. But he does arrive in Athens, the city of the philosophers. And what's fascinating about Athens in Paul's day is that the amount of idols in that city were actually more than the population of the city. I mean, idols dotted every single roadway, every back alley. Numerous stores had numerous idols in them. I mean, and each idol was designated to different gods and goddesses. I mean, the city was filled with religious ideals and ideas about what God the gods were like. So Paul is coming to that city and he has a message. And the message is, I'm proclaiming to you the one true God. So here I am, I'm reading from Acts 17 verse 24, where part of Paul's message is as follows. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, Now watch this. He says, nor is he served by human hands as if he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Now, it's an opening statement that he makes in that city. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful statement because I'm going to say he couldn't have expressed better uh, the biblical impulse for missions. God made the world. Um, no, no, the, the Greek temples don't house God. God's actually bigger than all of the ideals that you have. And furthermore, the God who made the world, says Paul, doesn't actually need anything from you. Now, that was important because in the Greek way of thinking, one of the reasons why you'd sacrifice to the gods is because the gods were hungry. And one of the reasons why you serve the gods is because the gods had needs and they were looking for human beings to fulfill those needs. And if human beings didn't fulfill those needs appropriately, I mean, the gods might trick you or the gods might, you know, do something nasty to you. So it was always appropriate to appease the gods. Uh, They were somewhat impetuous and you couldn't exactly predict what they'd do. Uh, So Paul comes with an open statement, say, you know, the God who made everything doesn't need Anything that you can produce, there's not one thing that your hand can do that will provide for God something's lacking in him. Now, when Paul says that, he's not the first person to ever say that. I mean, you can go all the way back to the First Testament and go to the book of Psalms, and I'm reading here from Psalm 50. And it's such an important psalm uh, because, you know, Israel in that day, in the writing of Psalm 50, was a nation that had become like Athens. 
Uh, what I mean to say is that they had imported the gods and the goddesses of the nations around them. And so, you know, they had built their own idols and the nation of Israel was filled with idols to all manner of foreign gods. And, and just like the Greeks, uh, in Israel, the gods needed to be served. They became hungry and the sacrifices that you'd find in the Old Testament, I mean, there began to be a rumor and a, a mythology that developed around it that said, I mean, we're sacrificing because as as we burn the offering, the gods are consuming the food that we're bringing towards them. And it's with this in mind that a man by the name of Asaph calls Israel to sing a song so that they might remember truth. And Psalm 50 verses 10 to 15 says, for every beast of the forest is mine. This is God speaking. Every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field. It's mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world in its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will glorify me. Now, this is a really a life-transforming psalm. Um, it, it begins with the same thing that, that Paul says. God doesn't actually need you for anything. I mean, that's what the psalmist says very directly. But I mean, look, God says, I, I already own everything. And let's spend some time thinking about that. I mean, God is the creator of the universe and has never relinquished his ownership to the universe. So God will say, well, the universe and, uh, you know, the, the stars that you see in the night sky or the thing that the, you know, the Hubble telescope brings you about these amazing pictures of the, you know, the, the amazing uh, orchestration of planets and stars and everything else that exists. God says, I made all of that. And all of that, I've put my stamp of ownership, it's mine, and I will never relinquish it. And then God goes beyond that and says, look, I also created this planet Earth, and I've not relinquished my ownership on that. I've created every rock. I've created every mountain. I've also created all the trees, and they're mine, the grass on the fields, that's mine. Uh, the cattle that eat the grass on the field, that's mine. And that cattle that you're sacrificing, that's mine. Do you think if I were hungry, and I'm not, but do you think if I was hungry, I'd come to you and ask you for something? Absolutely not. I own everything. That's what the psalmist is all about. And that's exactly what Paul announced in Athens. The God who made the earth, he said, is not served by human hands. And that was utterly revolutionary. Oh, my. It was God needs nothing of you. I'm going to ask you, my friend, who are watching this, do you think that there's anything that you've ever done that's provided service for God? And you know what I'm getting at? I'm eventually getting at the whole cause of missions. If the reason for wanting to be involved in missions is because you're saying, I'm offering a service to God, as if God needs your service to him, you're completely on the wrong track. You've got a man-centered approach to missions. That is, this is what human beings can do, and therefore, I'm doing this, and I'm helping God out. God knows the world's in a mess. God says, who's going to help me? I say, I'm, I'm good to go. And God says, I'm glad somebody came to the fore because that can help make this place better. That's the idea of a needy God. That's not the call of Christian missions. So Paul tells the Athenians uh, that given the nature of the one true God, uh, God does not depend on us for anything, and that is really all the revolutionary thinking that they could handle. And then, God, then Paul also began with the words, the God who made the world and everything in it. The God who made the world and everything in it. Now again, Paul's not coming up with that phrase. Um, you might want to think about Exodus chapter 9, and uh, it's the story of Moses. And Moses has gone to Pharaoh, and he says to Pharaoh, you let my people go, and Pharaoh says, no way, it's not going to happen. And so Moses unleashes a series of 10 horrific plagues that devastate Egypt. And after one of them, uh, a plague that is a, is a plague uh, on the agriculture, a hailstorm comes and devastates the agriculture, um, 
uh, Pharaoh asks Moses to go to God and make the hail stop. And Exodus 9.29, Moses said to him, that is said to Pharaoh, as soon as I've gone out of the city, I'll stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease. There will be no more hail that you may know, he says, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. You think Egypt belongs to you? It never did. It's an illusion. It always belonged to God. And the best thing you could do is to care for it in a way that God intended it to be done. See, that's it. Doesn't belong to you. So, given that God made everything, given that God owns everything, given that God is not served by human hands, A, he has no needs, and B, even if he had them and he doesn't, he sure wouldn't come to us. So what is mission? Why are we doing this thing? What exactly is happening? So we need to step back and say, okay, what was the creator's plan? When he made the creation, what was he up to? Why did the creator make the world? And then secondly, we'll also ask to ask, what's the nature then of mission? So let's start by asking, why does the creator create the world? And I want to take you to a passage from John chapter 17. In John 17, uh, Jesus is praying in the upper room with his disciples. It's in the last week. He is about to be taken and crucified. So this is just, it's a Thursday night going into Friday. Um, He is going to be crucified very shortly after this. Um, So he's in prayer, and the disciples are listening to him pray. It's often called the high priestly prayer. And I want to read to you from John 17, 4 to 5. Jesus is praying. He says, He's praying to the Father, I glorified you on earth, Jesus says, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. That is, as I go to the cross, Father, glorify me with the glory that you and I shared before the world came into being. You see, Jesus didn't believe that the cross would add more glory to God. Jesus believed that God was always all glorious. And by glorious, we mean that God is always the full, complete, and satisfied God. He's the God of infinite beauty, infinite wisdom. Uh, All of the attributes of God are excellent in which nothing can be added. So Jesus is saying, look, let's celebrate this glory of God, the glory that we had before the creation. And once we say that, it should revolutionize our way of thinking. You know, there's a song that we used to sing, and um, it's uh, in many ways a very God-glorifying song, but it had one line. It was very troubling. Uh, It spoke of the cross, and the line said, like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the fall and thought of me above all. Now, what's problematic about that line is not that Jesus thought about us on the cross. Of course he did. Um, Jesus went to the cross in order to save sinners. Of course he did. But the line that you thought of me above all is simply untrue. What Jesus thought above all, what concerned him most in going to the cross, and he prays about it, is so that he would experience and the glory of God, the, the glory that he had before the world began, this, this precious celebration of the joy of God. And Jesus says, let that be known. So Jesus' ultimate reason for going to the cross is to celebrate the greatness of God. Not a God who's needy, not a God who's looking for some way to fulfill uh, his lack, He's doing none of that. Rather, Jesus says, let's simply, in the cross, celebrate how great God is. And that takes time to unpack. I know that the cross saves sinners. It's a glorious message. But also, the cross demonstrates how great God actually is. The cross is a celebration of the fact that God is greater than the human mind can conceive. The cross is a celebration of this truth, that God is altogether righteous. He does nothing wrong. He punishes sin. He never has a dark side to him. The cross celebrates the greatness of God. See, and that's the impulse for mission. See, the greatest thing that a missionary can share with anybody is not 
Uh, we've got food for the gnawing hole in your stomach. Now, did you misunderstand what I just said? It's not that hunger is not important. It's not that an essential part of missions is not taking care of the physical needs of people. When they're hungry, we are called upon to feed them. When they are naked, we're called upon to clothe them. I mean, when um, they uh, have no access to education, Christian missions has often led the pathway in providing literacy and uh, education and to elevating a people's um, being so that, you know, that they actually move from absolute poverty to, to some measure of wealth and goodness. So it's not as if these things aren't important. But, but the point I've been trying to make, what's this world all about? I see, this world is a celebration of the greatness of God. So why does God create the world? Uh, let me take you to Isaiah 43, verse 7. Isaiah is telling Israel that Israel is precious to him. Uh, God loves his people. Um, he, is, he is redeeming his people. When they walk through the waters, they're not going to be overwhelmed. When they walk through the fire, they're not going to be burned. God is going to take away their sins. He's going to protect them. And uh, so Isaiah 43, 6 and 7 says, I will say to the north, Give them up, and to the south do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. I'm calling my people. Then verse 7, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So why does God create? And the answer is he does it for his glory. To ask why God created the world might be the same question as to ask, why does um, a gifted artist paint a painting that the human race has ever since found beautiful and uplifting? And the answer is because there was something precious inside the artist that spilled out onto a canvas, and the canvas was an expression of some beauty that the artist had seen. We might say the same thing of a musician who composes you know, a, a great piece of music, a staying piece of music that for hundreds and hundreds of years have captivated the human soul. Why did that musician decide to write that piece of music? A- and the answer is because there was a beauty that was inside of him that he felt that he had to express in some open way. That is, that when he did this, it was the joy of expressing externally what the musician had internally within him himself. And that's what we say about creation as a whole. This great and glorious God, this this God of infinite worth and the God of a perfect beauty and holiness, this God uh, who is so perfect nothing can be added to him. Uh, this God took the joy of being God, uh, the, the fulfillment that God had throughout all the ages and decided that he would go public, that he would express his joy of being God in the creation of a universe and in the creation of this earth and then in the creation of human beings made in his image. This is an expression of the greatness of God. There's a lot of people that don't know it, but that's why God created us. He didn't create us so that we might fulfill some need in God. He created us so that we might be the expression of his joy. That's why the greatest thing that any human being can ever do in their life is come to understand the greatness of God because in his presence, says the Bible, there's joy forevermore. Now, there's something else that we need to know about creation. Creation happens progressively. And when I say it happens progressively, I, I'm simply saying that that God did not decide that he would make all of creation a perfect display of his glory, but rather he decided to progressively make the created world an expression of his glory. So what do I mean? Well, if you read Genesis 1 verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So you know, the cosmos exists, and it's there in all its fullness, and it must have been a a powerful moment, the day when God actually spoke the universe into existence. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how that process was unfolded, except that that which had not yet existed, God simply spoke, and it came into being. 
universe. And then Genesis 1 verse 2 says, now the earth, because, you know, the Bible is the story of what happened on this earth. It says, now the earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. So for a time, and we don't know how long that time was, um, the earth was like a howling wasteland unfit for human habitation. No life could exist on this rock that was spinning out into space. And so God in time spoke meaning and purpose and beauty and an expression of his personhood onto this earth. But we also read that, that the process is not done. See, Numbers 14, verse 21 says, Indeed, as I live, God speaking, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. That's repeated in Habakkuk 2, verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that's the task of missions. God was leading this earth to a very particular moment. It's the moment when the Son of God was crucified on a cross to pay for the sins of people who had fallen from God and had sinned against him. So we have the cross at this centerpiece, and it stands as this place that expresses how lovely God is in his mercy and compassion with human beings who had shaken their fist at God and gone the other way. Explanation of wars, the explanation of disease, the explanation of all manner of disasters that befall us, the explanation of the fact that death haunts the human race, that broken relationships are everywhere, that explanation is all found in our sin. The cross stands as the cure for all of human sin. The the task of missions is to let the world know what God has done, who God is, and the purpose for all things. Once human beings embrace that they are the special project of God, created by a God who is infinitely glorious, and once they find out that they can have a relationship with this one God and enter into the joy of God, in whose presence there is joy forevermore, once they understand that suddenly something happens in their own hearts. They become reconciled to God. Their sins are forgiven. They fall at the feet of the God who made them and say, I'm your servant. And with that, at that very moment, we find our purpose in living. See, that's missions. It's a declaration of how great and lovely God actually is. It's sharing a message with a sad and ruined and rebellious humanity that it doesn't have to be this way. In fact, God has come in a glorious way to share himself with us. He's the greatest of all things. He's not doing it because he needs you. He's doing it because he loves you. He knows that the greatest thing that you could ever know is his presence in your life. It drives all of missions. Yeah, missions is about feeding the hungry. It is about clothing the naked. It is about uh, dealing with, you know, so much ignorance that is in the world. Yes, it's about all of that kind of stuff. But those are all penultimate things. The ultimate, the chief goal of all missions is a declaration of the glory of God. I don't think we can sit quiet until... The glory of God should be heard and understood and accepted and acknowledged and celebrated in every tribe and language and people group of the earth. Missions is this holy restlessness that exists in those of us who have come to see the joy of knowing God. Missions is a restlessness that it's not enough to simply know it for me. I can't be satisfied until every human being comes to acknowledge the one true God. It's the driving force behind all missions. It is the glad news that the Creator has come to us to share himself with us, his creation. It's a starting place. So during the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about some of the issues that make missions possible. And we're also going to talk about why it is that you and I, no matter who we are, no matter our station in life, can be involved in this wonderful enterprise. We need to celebrate a missionary God 
who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Thanks for listening today. Continue to watch and be encouraged in this celebration of the missionary God. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.